Gators Breakdown, the Gators Fan Podcast, because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Something special these next couple of weeks here on Gators Breakdown, these next couple of weeks, these next couple of episodes. And uh, Championship Rewind will take a look back at Florida's 2006 and 2008 National Championships. Take Casey and Brandon James hop on to give us an inside look at the games here uh, on these next couple of episodes uh, of Gators Breakdown. Look, we know everything going on in college football right now and season may be kind of up in the air. All these announcements of conference only games and we're still awaiting word on uh, what the SEC is going to do. But, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. But to buy time. Uh, as these summer's months dwindle around and we get closer to hopefully some football season. If you miss some football, you want to catch uh, all these great memories that we have from the 2006-2008 uh, National Championship Games, you can do it here on Gators Breakdown with some extended interviews with Tate Casey and Brandon James. But also, Gators Breakdown and Channel 4, the local station, will be broadcasting Championship Rewind, replays of the 2006 and 2008 Florida Gators National Championship Games, the 2006 2006- Six title game will air 8 to 10 p.m. on July 18th, and the 2008 title game will air the following Saturday, July 25th, 8 to 10 p.m. as well. Both will air on WJXT. If you're not in the Jacksonville area, you can also stream it on news4jax.com. Don't worry, I'll tweet all this out closer to the games and stuff. But if you want to kind of rewatch the games here, you know, as, as a Gator family, uh, you know, so on those broadcasts, you'll hear more from Tate Casey and Brandon James, two players who were be, you know big parts of those seasons uh, and, and played in those national title games. We'll have some you know fun interaction for you guys as well as we kind of always do on Gators Breakdown. So kind of stay tuned for that kind of a, a Zoom watch party uh, that we'll have uh, as far as part as uh, news for Jacks and, and Gators Breakdown. So it should be. A lot of fun, a lot of fun looking back at these two special years uh, for us Gator fans and those Florida Gator football players and the program itself. Uh, some fun years, so we'll take a look back and, and have a and have a good time doing it. So before we get into these interviews, looking at the 2006 season from Tech Casey and Brandon James, remember you can find Gators Breakdown at news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. You'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes as well as News 4 Jacks coverage of the Gators Please share, rate, and review the show. Subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. And follow Gators Breakdown on social media, on Twitter and Facebook, at Gators Breakdown. And without further ado, here is a look back at the 2006 season from Tate Casey and Brandon James. So we'll get started. 2006 National Championship game versus Ohio State. Man, the, the team had heard for a month that they didn't belong in that game uh, and couldn't hang with, with Heisman winner Troy Smith in Ohio State. How much was that you guys hearing for a month, a motivate a motivating factor going into that game? Yeah, I think for us it was um, it was more just eye on the prize and the mindset we had had the whole year. Um, obviously, we heard all the things that you know were said about us not belonging in that game and you know, to us, I think the biggest thing was we knew exactly where we belonged. Uh, we knew what, what kind of work we put in, what kind of preparation we had put in. And so uh, it, it just drove us a little bit more than what we were already pushing ourselves. That motivated the team big time. Um, you know, from my freshman year, I can vividly remember, you know, us having a uh, senior field defense, uh, a lot of upperclassmen who went through a lot with the uh, coaching change and everything like that. So being able to finish our career off, in the national title game. And then now, you know, we, we played the schedule we played. And then, you know, you're here, you don't even stand a chance because they have a Heisman winner because, you know, they've had the season they've had up until that point. I mean, everybody was motivated. And as freshmen, we just kind of followed the lead of the older guys and the upperclassmen and kind of, you know, we're just as motivated and just as hungry. Did you feel like playing in the SEC that season uh, prepared you guys? You had some knockdown drag out games all throughout the season with Alabama, LSU, uh, Arkansas in the SEC championship game, uh, uh, you know, a dramatic win at Tennessee as well. Uh, did the SEC prepare you guys to go against Ohio State? Oh, 100%. 100%. And, you know, with us, uh, you know, watching film and leading up to the national championship game, I think that that we liked where we stood in that matchup in regards to speed uh, and talent on both sides of the ball, um, especially on offense. You know, we'd heard a lot about Ohio State's defense. Uh, we'd seen them on film, a great group of, of hard-nosed players, but – you know, we felt our team had a lot of grit. Um, that 2016 was was full of grit and a lot of talent. So, 
you know, we liked where we stood. I think the biggest thing for us is we felt that nobody was really giving us a chance. And uh, and that chip on our shoulder kind of grew week by week leading up to that game. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, I think my freshman year was kind of the uh, start, the jump start of what the SEC is today. I think our national title, national title, my old, my freshman year was again the jump start to the SEC being as dominant as it is now. And uh, I think that was the year where you know you seen the recruiting was just different. The uh, the game play week to week was just different. You know, for it's just your conference schedule was just different that year. I mean, you talking about playing Auburn, and, you know, close games with uh, Vanderbilt and all you know all kinds of teams that were you know on paper not predicted to be very good but when you're in the SEC everybody's everybody's good everybody's ready to play so I think again that was the year that kind of stamped as the uh you know the beginning of the dominance of the SEC. Did the stature of the game change Meyer and and the way he approached the game or or the coaching staff just in general would could you tell it was a bigger game to him or was it just uh, business as usual with him? I'm gonna tell you what with that staff the one thing I will say and, and with that team there wasn't such thing as a bigger game than the next and the one thing about that 06 team that I always tell people was it you know not only did it have grit and talent but it had a bunch of guys that were just so hungry to win a championship and uh, and when Urban came in and really you know worked us through the middle middle aspect of being a team and a championship caliber team and what exactly that consisted of that's when we really started getting that cohesive unit um it Urban doesn't change, right? Urban doesn't change. You you could play, you could play a you know a two and two and nine team for a second week of the season. You could play a, a twelve and zero team for a championship game, and he approaches it the same way. And I think that that is one of the key factors uh, for us as a team and how we approach every single game, because it wasn't necessarily about just winning week to week. It was we were going to be the best in the country in preparation. And we're going to be the best in practice. And we're going to be the best in the game and we're going to end up winning no matter what we're putting ourselves up against. Well, if doubt crept in, crept into your guys' mind, it may have been after the opening kickoff and Ted Ginn races, uh, races that kickoff back. What's the, what's the thought on the sideline? Uh, what are, what are the coaches telling you guys when, when Ted Ginn's racing down the sideline and it's seven, nothing, 15 seconds into the game? You know, for me, it was funny because I think a lot of guys in the special teams unit, you know, guys that were on special teams meetings week to week, we knew what our what our game plan always was for kickoff and kickoff coverage. Um, and, and we didn't necessarily execute the kick the way we were supposed to for the game plan. Um, obviously, that, that went against us in the ex- exact way you don't want it to because uh, you're relying on a number of things in, in our scheme on kickoff coverage. Um, you know, minus a, a hole or a possible block in the back, which doesn't really matter. I think the guys that have been in that film room and know exactly what we have to do to execute that play uh, kind of saw it coming as soon as we kicked it mm-hmm. because I, I was sitting there going, oh, guys, ain't going to be good. Um, and, of course, they take one to the house and, and Ted Ginn, obviously a phenomenal talent, and they lose him right after that, uh, unfortunately, um, because of an injury on a celebration. You know, for us, I think the biggest thing was early in the game. You know, it, had that happened fourth quarter maybe – uh, to put a dagger in us, it may have been a different feeling. But for us, you know, you got a whole game to play, and, and we knew what the game plan was, and we knew how successful it could, could help us be. So I think the biggest thing for us is just turn around, you know, sudden change, get the ball back, and let's go. Exciting for me. Uh, at the same time, I was like, boy, he's really he's really that fast, you know, because, of course, I grew up watching ball, and I knew about Ted Ginn before I even got to college. So, you know, you see him <laughs> speed down the sideline, and, you know, Coach Myers is a big special teams guy, so we spent a lot of time. I remember being in a lot of meetings and talking about we can't let him, you know, beat us. But uh, for myself, once he takes it back, you know, immediately in my mind, you've known me since I was in high school, you know, I'm immediately thinking, hey, it's my time to make a play. There. All the, you know, all the cameras, all the eyes are going to be on me. So what can I do to kind of set my mark and uh, kind of get a, the momentum going back in our direction? Just talk about the resiliency of uh, of not backing down after that, and, and and Chris Lee, you know, of course, leading the offense and a big game for him. Uh, of course, everything he he went through for a lot of you guys who were there before, but to respond, you know, just right away on, on offense and pretty much getting everybody involved from the get go. Well, you know, if you if you talk Chris and you can talk uh, a lot of those seniors, especially on the offensive side of the ball, you know, Dallas Bakers of the world, the Andre Caldwell's, the Jamel Cornelius, and those 
those older group of guys that really had a lot to do with the reason we were in that position in the first place. Um, I, I think I'll never forget, you know, the first time I ever saw Emmett Smith um, in person, you know, outside of growing up and watching him play for the Cowboys was on the sideline in that game. And right after that happened, the opening kickoff goes back for a touchdown. I think he was probably fired up more than anybody on our team in regards to don't don't let that even, you know, get in your minds. You still a whole game to play type type deal. And uh, and I don't think anybody had a, a shred of doubt we were going to come back and, and throw another punch. But it, it was just cool to see the way we did respond. And, and I don't think anybody on our sideline expected any less than that. Playing against Troy Smith and Ohio State and that offense, they were they were scoring points left and right going into the season. And, you know, Florida for this offense, it was – did enough on offense, you know, to get by as a, as the season went on. You guys, you know, found the way. No matter how you know how ugly it may have looked in the first half, you guys found a way in the fourth quarter, put some points on the board, and get out with, get get out with a victory. So there, there was a lot of talk that this offense wouldn't hang with Ohio State's offense. But you know, what clicked versus Ohio State was it something you guys saw in preparation, or was it something not of? Of course, preparation comes into it, but you know, what what clicked that night? Well, I think game planning. Uh, throughout the whole bowl process, we felt confident that, you know, if we just did what we were good at doing, we will be fine. And again, like you said, I mean, my freshman, you talk about so many good athletes. I mean, you know, Percy, you got CI, you got uh, Bubba Caldwell, you got Dallas Baker, Jamel, uh, Jamel Cornelius, like all these guys, Chris Lee from Tebow, you got two, and uh, Deshaun Wynn, you got too many different threats to kind of honor compared to, I felt like they, you know, Troy Smith, I think they had one good running back. I can't remember his name. I know they had the freshman at the time that came in with us, Beanie Wells, correct? Yep. Um, and then Ted again, but he ended up, ended up getting injured. But I just felt like we had more to offer. And uh, we executed and did what we did well. I mean, I think it kind of showed that night that we were tough to stop. I think for us, it was a challenge. You know, to be told to be told that your manhood's on the line and that you're being, you're being challenged um, by, by a team that we felt uh, we should be on the field with that was the biggest thing, not only just for the offense, but but for the team, right? We had heard so much about Troy Smith. He'd heard so much about an explosive offense and and putting up points. Our defense was about tired of hearing it, and, and I can tell you right now, the guys like Brandon Seiler and Earl Everett of the world and Reggie Nelsons, uh, they were they were chomping at the bit, you know, to take that challenge on. I think for us as an offense, I think the biggest thing was we got challenged pretty heavy up front. You know, by uh, by John Avesey and and Steve Adazio and Urban and Dan Mullen to be that hard nosed unit up front that controlled the tempo of the game. And when you go back and look at it, you know Deshaun Wynn, you know Tebow, Harvin, the the run game that we had in that game. I mean, it's hard to deny. You, know, you rushed for 100, 150 plus yards that game, and you know three touchdowns. Tim had a lot to do with that. You know Deshaun Wynn had a lot to do with that. Um, and then you turn on the flip side of things and watch how the defense approached that game with the tenacity they played with, um, you know, to limit Ohio State to under 50 rush yards and under 100 total yards. Uh, it's a complete domination on both sides of the football. And I think just a hard nosed mentality had a lot to do with that. There's, there's Bubba Caldwell, there's Cornelius Ingram, there's Dallas Baker, there's Jamal Cornelius, there's yourself. Deshaun Wynn, Percy Harvin, Tim Tebow, Chris Leak. I mean, the, and, and kind of, you know, the first guys to name off the more skill players to spread the ball out to so many players in this game. Was there something that was identified in, in preparation of, hey, let's go go out there and, and attack them a myriad of ways? I mean, you know, the special players Tebow and Harvin were, but that wasn't really the key of the offense until 2007, 2008. But in 2006, it seemed like, hey, we need to get everybody involved for this offense to really take off. Yeah, and we, and we did some things different. You know, we, we kind of changed up. When you mentioned Cornelius Ingram, he, he became a very, very big part of our offense later in the season in 2006 that, you know, he, he was a he was an ex-quarterback. And we had him to the tight end room and, and the slot, you know, and allowed him to do some things out wide at receiver. And, and we could shift him around. You, you had Billy Latsko, who, you know, him and myself didn't really have much of a – I, I, we had our role in regards to blocking, but you could utilize both of us out of the backfield or both of us in the red zone. And I think that, you know, Urban and Dan did a really good job of trying to figure out what that role is going to be earlier in the season. And I think it really played well for us, you know, down the road. We had a good team. And not only that, you had a two deep, three deep roster on both sides of the football that were more than capable of playing at that caliber, you know, that championship caliber level in a big time atmosphere. And they didn't bother them. 
I mean, when you look even past Jamel Cornelius and some of those guys and, and you look all the way down the line, you, you also got to remember you had guys like Riley Cooper and, and Lewis mm-hmm. Murphy playing on special teams, um, you know, and, and the David Nelsons of the world. So you know, a lot of guys that ended up being household names down the road, but they could easily slide right in. If a guy goes down, it's next man up mentality. And there was no doubt in any of those position rooms that those guys could get the job done. Everything definitely went right. I think, uh, again, I think it was the bowl practice that we had leading up to it. Our upperclassmen did a good job of preparing us. But I, I, one of the biggest things I think Coach Meyer always preaches is just speed. I mean, our speed took over um, from, you know, when Tebow's getting in and running, from when Percy's getting jet stretches, from, you know, Bubba Caldwell getting the ball. I mean, we just had so many guys that can run. And I think the speed kind of just hit them all at once, and it was tough for them to defend. What kind of kind of player was was Chris Leak? Of course, much was made about can he fit in Urban Meyer system? Can that offense work with him? Then T- Timbo comes in in two thousand six, and it was a, a a needed mobile quarterback element of the offense. There, uh, I'm not sure you know either one of those guys probably need to rely on each other in two thousand six for you guys to get where you ultimately got in and hoisting a trophy. Uh, what type of player quarterback was Chris Leak? And you know how did how do you go back and look at the, the rotation between him and Tebow and how that worked uh, mentally for those guys? I think it worked well. Um, at some times, I think it was tough for Chris um, because Chris being the type of recruit that he was coming in, him having the success he had had up until his senior year, I think it might have been tough for him at times. But um, I think our coaching staff did a great job. Coach Mullen, Coach Meyer came up with a great plan of integrating both guys. And I, I don't think it took anything away from our offense. Um, and, I mean, Tebow – deservingly you know needed to be on the field and he was such a good threat running wise and me now as a coach seeing the difference when your quarterback offers a threat to run the ball compared to when you just got a pure uh, pocket guy back there um I mean it's it's a tough for a defense to handle so I think we needed that that year especially with what we're producing from the uh as a running back standpoint I don't think we're just a dominant team from the running back standpoint so we needed an extra um uh, um, and I think the quarterback run brought it and brought that to our team. And I think Tebow did a good job of uh, capitalizing on it. Chris, to me, very similar to how very similar to how Tim was student of the game. You know, Chris was a very dedicated student of the game. He was one of those guys that was always he was always getting his his mind, his body exactly where it needed to be uh, to be the captain and to be the leader. And I think, you know, obviously he knew his role, knew with Tim coming in that that was going to be a good shakeup for us. They're going to give us some some run capabilities that maybe Chris not necessarily tailored for, but at the same time, he was one of those guys that did anything he needed to do for his team. And so I think when a lot of people talk about Chris Leak, I think they fail to mention really how much ego he dropped at the door, you know, in order to to do exactly what we needed to do to win championship level football games. And, you know, obviously Tim comes in and, and changes college football forever. Um, in 2007 and eight, and it really takes a lot of shadow that's casted on Chris Lee. But I think a lot of people fail to realize just exactly how great a season he had, you know, for being a guy who wasn't necessarily made for that system, but he was a student of the game. He made it work. The sideline had to have a lot of fun going out there and watching that defense play <laughs> that night. Oh. They harassed Troy Smith all night long. Was there in leading up to that game, was there anything you guys did in, in, in preparation to help the defense? What, the, what, what did you guys do on offense? And I know scout team, scout team plays and stuff into that, but what did, what did you guys do to help that defense get prepared for that offense? Well, it was, it was a lot of drag out. You know, we, it, Urban was a big proponent of one-on-one, you know, first team versus first team scrimmaging and, and inside drills and blitz pickup drills. A lot of that, you're not getting off where you're only – you know, scout squad versus the ones, right? A lot of teams will, will say we need to preserve our mm-hmm. unit, our first team, and play them against the scouts. Just make sure we're polished up. It, it, unless things have changed in the last 10, 12 years, I can say honestly, you weren't getting away with that. Uh, you know, I, I, I tore four ligaments of my ankle the first day of padded practice for the national championship game in inside drill, ones versus ones. Um, and there was there were some serious battles going on in the trenches. We had a lot of guys that um, – they thought that that was the best way for us to win that game and it completely have a huge feeling that that was. Um, the defense knew what they were facing with the offense. We knew Vernon Golson and Malcolm Jean because a lot of the defensive guys they had on that Ohio State team were solid guys, you know, guys that were going to go play in the NFL for, for a long time. But we also felt we had a lot of guys that were going to play in the NFL for a long time as well. 
And so for us, I think the biggest thing is we were going to go just all out, whether that whether it was, you know, getting hurt doing it, whether it was you maybe a little sore and this and that. But we knew the payoff in a month, you know, in a matter of 25, 30 days. Once we put that work in, that game was going to be a hell of a lot easier than the practices you had to endure to get there. That's one of the times where you're glad you're on the team with those guys and not going against them. I mean, you got I, I, I hold the line, I think, from that year went to the NFL. You know what I mean? And then you got Brandon Siler, you got uh, uh, Earl Everett, you know what I mean? All these different guys that were just hungry, man. And I'm telling you, man, every time he dropped back, it seemed like two or three guys were touching. And uh, that just shows, again, the speed that we had team-wide, not just offensively, but at the same time, the talent level, um, the difference of the talent level. I mean, it was sometimes where – I, I can vividly remember, like, the, the, the tackles not even touching Moss or uh, Derek Harvey, like, not at all, just free release, and they're touching uh, Troy. I, I, I will I'll say this. The 2006 defense was the first time really in college that I got a chance to to really enjoy watching your defense work. Um, you know, 04, when I, when I first got to Florida, it was – you get off the field, you go to the bench, you get your adjustments, you kind of take your breather. Right. Oh five, I, I think we finally started getting a little respect for the the I guess you call it quasi swagger or whatever whatever the defense was bringing to the table, and they had a great season in 05. But 06 was one of those units that they brought the ticket to the game in 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 06, and we wouldn't be in that position without them. But when you watch Reggie Nelson playing center field. And you got Brandon Siler in the middle with Earl Everett and Brian Crum, and you got these guys up front. And there was some stellar talent up front on that defensive line, and about a two deep roster on, on you know on the defensive line with Joe Cohen and Jarvis Moss and Derek Harvey, and the list goes on and on and on. It, it was fun to watch, and it, it made you literally you almost wanted to rush your position coaches like, yeah, yeah, we get it. We know our mistakes. Like we, we got our adjustments, but let, let, let us go watch these guys play because they were that exciting to watch. And, you know, you almost, you almost held your breath waiting for one of those Reggie Nelson hits or one of those Earl Everett, you know, sacks or one of those Derek Harvey moments uh, getting in the backfield and just disrupting the play. And in that game, it was phenomenal. You got every bit of that and more. 34-14 halftime score there. What was the mood at halftime? Of course, you had such a big lead, uh, but you knew you were facing a, a very talented team, uh, Ohio State, who have been deemed you know uh, the best team that season. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was go, go keep doing what you're doing, but uh, there's got to be more to it than that. Just keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> it wasn't really much to say. I mean, we're executing at a high level early in that game, and the defense was playing so well. And you got some early turnovers and things like that. I mean, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep executing. I think for us, it was one of those moments where we knew the work that went into it. We had been told for weeks, you put this work in, you put this work in, you're going to be in a position to be national champions. And at halftime, I think it was the first time you have a second to, you know, okay, settle your mind down, get your adjustments, think about things. But at the same time, you're also sitting there going, all right, it's making sense now. Everything we've been told is, is what's happening right now. And the biggest thing for us was, Put the foot pedal down, right? Just go straight for the neck. Go straight for the jugular. Don't even take a second guess at letting these guys back into this game. And for us, I think that was that was the mindset going into half, and that was the mindset times 10 coming out of half. Well, the best example of that, of course, is not long after halftime. Uh, I'm sure you guys uh, you know, wanted to – it, besides what, besides like a game-winning play, one of the one of the bigger plays in Gator football history is Earl Everett making a tackle way out of his helmet on, and pretty much speaks to what you just said, what you guys were thinking at halftime. You're that close, go out there and 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 put the foot on the throat here. But uh, what was it like watching that play and that and the team reaction as well to that play? It, it's still to this day one of the best. I, I guess it, it embodies everything about that team. And I think that that's when you look back at that play, it's not that it's Earl Everett and how mm -hmm. great of a person he is and how much he deserves that kind of spotlight at times. And, and man, he was one of the hardest workers, uh, not on the defense, on that team. Um, still to this day, one of the hardest players I've ever had to go against in practice, whether it's in pass routes or running, doesn't matter. Um, but I think when you look at the 2006 team, it's a microcosm of that season and who we were and who, who, what our identity was as a team. And, and that's what resonates with me because, you know, every person on that team, that's how, that's how they played. 100 miles an hour, 
from whistle to whistle, you know, zero to six seconds of relentless effort until until the whistle blows and you go on to the next play and nobody ever let off the pedal. And I think that's why it resonated most with the team, because we knew exactly what our identity was. And that, you know, like you said, that, that that play was probably the best example uh, going and looking at uh, what that team accomplished there. So 2006, of course, Percy Harvin, highly recruited guy. Tim Tebow, highly recruited guy. They both both of those guys come in, but you're you know you're a senior heavy team with these two high profile freshmen coming in, and they get a lot of playing time. How special were those players? That, and you know, from the start of the season, from the start of training camp, could you tell those two guys were going to be heavy parts of the, of the 2006 season? We always kept in touch with the recruiting, the rival stuff, and follow uh, recruits and. Um, I actually was looking him up, Spikes up. I was looking all those guys up, and you know, I had new Percy had won a couple different uh, state titles in track and all that good stuff there. And of course, you watch his highlights, um, you see that he's a dynamic player. So you know, I did a good job of following guys. I remember I followed Jared Faison before he even got there. So you know, I was real big on competition. So I was already looking guys up to see you know how I could measure up against some of these guys. I think it was before that, you know, once when you when you have those guys come on campus early and Tim was one of those guys that was on campus in January and and in the weight room and doing his workouts right off the get go. uh, I think the first time I ever really, truly saw exactly what Tim was, you know, as a as a athlete, as a person, et cetera. Uh, was his first day in the weight room. And I think he put 225 up about, two, you know, 26 times. And that, that may have been – Vic Barati, I think, told him, all right, you're good. You, you may never bench press again for the <laughs> next four years. But just the intensity and, and the mindset. You know, as, as the guys who had Urban and them the first go-round of the spring in 05, it, it was a night and day difference for us on mental toughness, on how to approach workout sessions, on how to approach – you know, the game. And in 06, I think the, the best thing for guys like Tim Tebow and Percy Harvin was all of the seniors and juniors above them that demanded everybody lived up to that standard. And and now that's, you know, obviously with Dan Mullen now, that's what we call the Gator standard. That is what it is. Uh, and, you know, it's relying upon those upperclassmen to really set the bar and make sure that everybody lives up to that standard day in and day out. And, you know, those guys – had a huge, huge impact on the younger guys that were, you know, their classmates, right? When you look at Riley Cooper and Lewis Murphy and some of those 06, uh, 06 guys, they had, a, you know, they had to live up to that as well. When you've got guys like Percy and Tim who are playing, those other guys, they, they live up to it just as much, even if they're not on the field. I tell you, you guys have been through a whole lot, you know, you in particular going through a, a coaching change with Ron Zook, Turbin Meyer, you're being crowned national champions now. Confetti's falling, all of that. Uh, what's your thought of finally all the hard work paying off and you're, you're hoisting that crystal ball? Yeah, I, I think that the biggest thing is I had kind of me and Billy Latsko talked about it after the game in the room um, and, and rooming with Billy being a, a senior. I got a chance to see, man, like how much it hit him as a senior and finally get, you know, get something out of it. And I think our discussion was a little bit about could you imagine going through four or five years of this and not walking away with anything um, and not walking away with a ring or not walking away with even a conference championship, the sweat and the tears and everything you put into it. And not only that, just the mentality change that, that you've got to go through to be a championship caliber football team. Um, it, it's one thing to be in the game, but our mindset was so ingrained that it, we didn't, we didn't ever feel satisfied with being in the position or having the opportunity. Our biggest thing was the preparation was going to be so good that when the opportunity came, there's no chance we're losing that game. And so I think to walk away knowing that we we fulfilled that and we felt satisfied with where we were, that's the biggest thing. Uh, it, it was an unbelievable feeling. I still think it took about a week or two to sit in. Um, I think we got back to campus and it finally hit a lot of us that you know what we just accomplished was pretty big. But for the guys coming back, I know for us, it was like, man, I can't wait to get back, get back to ball in two mm-hmm. weeks, you know, three weeks and get back to these voluntary workouts. Because I think we knew what we were losing mm-hmm. with all the guys that were leaving. We knew we lost Chris. We knew we lost to Sean Wynn. We had a lot of guys that, that were going to be out. But at the same time, we knew what had coming back. And I think for, for some of us that were, you know, juniors and now the upperclassmen, that was the biggest thing for us was, we got a chance to, to make a run. 
you know, he got a chance to win two out of the next three, possibly three out of the next four. And that was something I think for a lot of us drove us even more. It's like, man, we just won that. All we have to do is repeat that mindset day by day by day and continue to get better. We're going to be in, in a great spot. Of course, obviously 2008 comes along down the road, but you know, that was our mindset. Uh, it was crazy, man. It was a real surreal moment. I could vividly remember just being in that, being in Miami and, you know, finally being able to say we're state champions and that, that never being done in St. Augustine. So you accomplish that. And, you know, I'm a football historian, so I can remember the year, that same year, watching Reggie Bush take on Texas and all that good stuff in the national title game. You snap your fingers and the very next year, you're, you know, I mean, the confetti's coming down and you win the national title. So it was crazy, man. And, uh, you're caught up in the moment a little bit, and uh, so it's hard to kind of sit back and really take it all in. But at the same time, you know, I could, you know, I remember me and Jock took our picture in front of the uh, BCS title, and I told him, like, dude, we're just looking at this trophy the year before on TV, and, you know, now we're taking a picture in front of it. So, you know, you just try to enjoy it at the same time, um, but do your job. It was a special moment, man. And myself, I know uh, Jarvis Moss, Reggie Nelson, uh, Brandon Silas, some of those guys really took me under their wing um, and kind of showed me the ropes of college and showed me what game field was all about. So, you know, you kind of just want to repay them back and make sure you do your job to the highest level and make sure, you know, there's no slip ups when it's time when your number's called because you don't want to be the guy that's called out by any of those cats. So, um, I mean, it's a special dude, it's a special moment, man, because you know what, how much they went through. Like, they, <laughs> we heard it all the time. They told us, they reminded us all the time about how it was before Irv got there. So, um, to be able to send them off the right way, that was a, that was a special feeling as well. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. A lot of good insight there from Tech Casey and Brandon James taking us a look back at the 2006 season. That was a whole lot of fun, not a lot of not a lot of big expectations going into that year, but of course, ending, hoisting the crystal ball and winning the second national championship in program history. Uh, as I said, next week, we'll go over the 2008 season or 2008 national championship game. Um, and, you know, the kind of how that was different in 2006. You'll hear how that was a little different for those guys uh, with, you know, take Casey, Brandon James joining us again. But a lot of fun uh, discussing these two seasons uh, with these guys. But, as I said, next week on the podcast, we'll do the 2008 National Championship. But don't forget, coming up, the 06 title game will air 8 to 10 p.m. on July 18th. And the 08 title game will air the following Saturday, July 25th, 8 to 10 p.m. as well. Both will air on WJXT and also stream on News4Jacks.com. That'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown. Gators Breakdown.